All right, good evening, everybody. We are finishing things up tonight here on our lesson on stewardship in regard to our, the use of our treasures. Uh, in last week's lesson, uh, the, the first part of this lesson anyway, we explored uh, some important concepts. We looked at the different principles of giving offerings to the church, and there were a good seven of them, things like uh, that, that we give regularly, that we give proportionately with a cheerful, willing, and eager attitude, that um, it's proportionate or balanced with our income, that we give uh, of our first fruits that show our faith. And when we do this, what we see is how God connects the topic of Christian giving with his giving to us, and especially in relation to uh, how Christ gave himself for us in a very selfless, sacrificial way. And in the same way, then, uh, we can be selfless, sacrificial givers. Because what we learn then is, as we heard last week, what God wants is our hearts and our loyalty, not our possessions. And then we more or less finish things up by looking at the wonderful thing that the offerings go toward these days. Uh, that goal of giving, the goal of supporting the work of the church, of bringing people to faith in Christ, keeping them in faith. Getting into part five, uh, we're going to look just a little bit here at the topic of proportionate giving. Uh, proportionate meaning, I guess you could say, a reasonable amount of what uh, we make. Okay, and no passages to read in this section, but we got a couple of questions here. Uh, in the Old Testament, God required the Israelites to give the 10% or the tithe. You might remember that from last week. For his New Testament church, God does not set a specific percentage. Instead, he wants the offering to spring from a person's faith. As such, he only offers the guideline of offerings that are proportionate to our income. So, I'm not telling you what percentage you have to give, just make sure that it's in proportion with what you're making. Now that said, how can the tithe serve God's people today? Can this still be useful and helpful for us in some way, shape, or form, that 10%? Yes. How so? We're not commanded to tithe. How can it still be helpful? Well, Anna, you're nodding your head. Can you think of a good reason? Helping out the church. Okay. Something like homeless people or something like that. All right. Think about it this way. God asked the Israelites to give 10%. So pretty clearly... For the general public back then, he saw 10% as a proportionate or reasonable amount for a person to give. Something that wasn't going to be too much and be an unnecessary burden on them, or too little where they're not exercising or demonstrating their faith. If God saw 10% as proportionate for them back then, complete this sentence, then... 10% could help us how? 10% could be blank for us today. Helpful or proportionate. It, the 10% could be a good starting point for us to consider. That, okay, wh when we're trying to figure out what is a reasonable amount for me to give that is proportionate, when I try to make that decision in my Christian freedom, how do I decide? Well, we have this already in place. Not that it's commanded, but that it could serve as a good starting point for us to consider in the offerings that we give. And I think that's how it can really be a benefit for us today. Next question, question number two. If the Israelites were commanded to give 10%, what do you think is the average percentage of a person's income that is given by members in the wells? And really, this is not just the wells. This is pretty much across uh, Christian churches in general, even American society in general. 
What do you think is the average percentage of a person's income that's given to support the work of the church? <coughs> Dylan? I'm, I'm asking for a percentage, not an actual amount. Anna said 1%. What do you say? 5%. 5%? You're going to say 5%? All right. You guys are you're, you're right in the ballpark there. 8%. Now we're getting a little too high. The average percentage is usually between 2.1 and 2.3%. So you can write that down for number two. So if you're making, yes, Lydia? what's that? I do not have an extra one on me. You'll have to just uh, refer to Aaliyah's. So if you're making 50 grand a year, which is actually a little bit above, let, let, let's go with 40 grand a year. If you're making $40,000 a year, what is 2% what is, uh, of $40,000? Can I look at my calculator? Nope. Four hundred dollars is one percent of forty thousand. So what is two percent? Eight hundred dollars. What's two point one percent? Eight hundred ten. Eight hundred forty dollars. So anywhere from eight hundred forty dollars to nine hundred twenty dollars per year. That's not a lot. No, that's not much. Exactly. It is very easy to be giving a lot more. <clears throat> And I just think about this in regard to the work of the church, that even if people, if, if across the board people were on average giving 5%, how much more work would the church be able to accomplish? You know, how many more people would be eager and willing to, to consider the ministry as a, a lifetime pursuit, uh, as an occupation? Because, okay... We have the finances in place to ensure that the tuition of students at our ministerial education schools is such that they're not going to come out of college and seminary with any debt. In fact, we're going to be able to pay for the majority of their tuition. Would you be a little bit more enticed, maybe, Brody, to consider ministry if that were the case? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah? Now, of course, it's not that simple. You have to have the gifts and the desire and the heart for it, too. There's those other factors that go into play. But you remove that deterrent, and it's there. Or think of it this way, not just supporting <coughs> ministry itself, but supporting kind of what Remy was getting at a little bit ago, of, of helping the homeless or those who uh, are in need, that we could be a, a, a system of charity and support and living out that aspect of the church. I think of how much work could be done for the sake of the gospel if Christians would be following these principles of Christian giving a little bit more. Now, you have a chart there in your packet that uh, is a good resource for you to take a look at. It shows you on the left-hand column if your annual income is whatever amount, so let's go with 41600 your weekly income would be $800 based on a 52-week uh, work year. If you're giving 3% a week, you would be giving $24 a week. Um, you'd be giving $40 for 5%, 7%, 56 and so on. Now, of course, when we talk about proportionate, there are other factors that we have to take into play in consideration because the person or the, the, the couple with uh, one child is going to have a different level of, of income and uh, expenses than the people with five children, right? And so it, it, it's not apples to apples. Yes, Quinn. A kid's income? You know what? That's So, since you mentioned that, it's not quite kid's income, but more like college student's income. When I was in college, you know, or high school and then college, I was working grocery store, as, as you guys know. And uh, when I was working at, at, you know, as much as I could, 
I was earning up to about $300 a week while I was working. Now, while I was at school itself, <clears throat> I was not making any money at all because I was away from school. I wasn't near where my job was. And the bulk of the year, I was managing uh, for a couple of different sports, for football and for women's basketball. And at that time, uh, it was a shame of all shames. Well, not that bad, but it was wrong, but the managers of those sports were not paid positions. I figure for all the work that I did over the, the years, uh, three years of, of schooling, uh, doing managing stuff, if I were just given the, the minimum wage back then, which is five twenty-five an hour, I would have made over $10,000 uh, before taxes, but uh, obviously didn't make that. So I didn't have as much money. Uh, I was only working during summer breaks or when I went home over Christmas or spring break. And um, up to $300, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm not making much right now. Um, I'm not in a position to give much. And I was giving much less or a bit less than, than uh, the 10%. But I was, I was giving, which, okay, that's at least something. But then I had this realization. Is it really going to hurt me if I... If I, may, if I give the 10%, I mean, what's the difference between, I don't know what I was giving, maybe $15? If I give $30 and it's the 10%, is that going to have a big impact on me at this point in my life? No. And so even, even when I was in school, then doing that, that 10%, and things turned out just fine for me. God, learned, God knows how to bless in other ways, and he certainly did, because you know how I said... Uh, I was still giving that 10%. I was still um, not making money for managing sports. Once I got to seminary, there was a family at my church's, uh, at my church, uh, elderly couple, Louis and Elaine Keitna. Wonderful, wonderful, kind, tender hearted people. And they had a love and an appreciation uh, for their pastors and especially for those who were training for the ministry. And I didn't see Louie and Elaine often. The only time I would see them uh, during the year was uh, midweek Lenten services on Wednesdays, and my home church also had midweek Advent services as well. We don't really have those here other than one service. That was the only time I'd see them, but every time I'd see them, Louie would see me, he'd quick duck into the bathroom, and in the bathroom, he'd take out his wallet and he'd pull out like two or three Benjamins and give them to me. Every single time. I figure over the course of the three years of my seminary life, while I was going to uh, church at my home church, he probably gave me about 10 grand. The Lord can bless you in other ways that you don't look for. And we'll come back to that thought at the end of this lesson. Uh, absolutely wonderful couple uh, and, and love them. So, getting to the bold type here at the bottom. Proportionate giving starts with a question. I have mentioned this last time. And that question is not how much should I give God, but how much has God given to me? That's what's going to spur on uh, what we are going to give. And so please keep in mind that if proportionate for you is 10%, that's great. 14% great. If it's only 5% because your family situation, you know, you're underemployed uh, or you have a lot of mouths to feed, if it's only 5%, hey, that's fine. If it's 2%, that is fine. Okay? The point here is that God is not concerned with the amount of your giving. He's concerned with your heart. That's where it all starts. And it says, a heart that is motivated by the love of Christ and trust God to provide our needs will naturally show itself in what it returns to God. It will show both its love for God and its trust in God. Before we move on to part six, I do think it's important for me as your teacher, if I'm going to be teaching this, if I'm going to be saying, hey, 10%, that for the general population... 10% is attainable. There's always exceptions, but for the general population, 10% is attainable. I think it's very important for me to be putting my money quite literally where my mouth is and tell you that in every year of my ministry, 
I've been in the ministry now for almost 17 years, you know. Started in 2006, it's 2023, so almost 17 years. And every year, I have given over 10%. Now, I don't say that to, you know, uh, say, hey, look at me, look at how awesome I am, uh, and, and toot my own horn. That's not my intent here. My intent is to show you, first of all, that, hey, I am doing what I'm teaching. I'm leading from the front. But also, number two, to show you, this is possible, folks. It is possible. And even now, you know, with uh, the, um, the house that we have, uh, all the other things, do you guys honestly have any idea of how much it costs to be an adult? <laughs> what do you think a monthly mortgage is? Five hundred bucks for a monthly mortgage? Holy more smokes, that. that would be awesome! Fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen? No, not fifteen. Like, yeah, grand, two grand. You're getting more in the neighborhood. It obviously depends on uh, a multitude of factors, such as when you bought the house, did you put down a twenty percent? To avoid the PMI, which is the the private mortgage interest, uh, which is um, the bank's way of trying to cover themselves in case if you go belly up and you're not able to pay them back, uh, that that that's it's like an extra few hundred bucks onto your mortgage. But so it, let's just assume you've got the twenty percent down payment, like like we did. All right, More monthly mortgage covers. The principal, you know, what you're actually doing to pay off the house. The interest, because, well, the bank wants to take its cut. Uh, the insurance for the house and property taxes. Uh, those four things. For us, currently, $1,782.53 a month is what it's at. What's so, your net pay? Um, prior to housing which is uh, something that the church will give on top. It's a little under 50000 a year is what I make. So do the math. 1800 times 10 is 18000 Add another 3600 onto that. You're talking $21,600 um, approximately in, uh, in just mortgage payments every year if I choose not to pay more. Now add cell phone, uh, maybe your internet, yes. um, if you got cable TV, food, clothing, Utility utilities, very good. Gas. Yeah, that, that's part of the utilities. Oh, gas for cars, yeah. Car payments, if you got those. It ain't cheap being an adult. Money does not grow on trees. And I have all of those things, and yet... Still able to give 10%. I don't make a lot. You know, I just told you I make. It's a, it's a good livable wage. I will I will acknowledge that. But it's not like I'm I'm raking in the dough. But my wife and I are able in a position we can give 10% and give even more than that. And we're doing just fine. We can still enjoy, you know, the the, the blessings of life. That God gives. Yes, Caleb. What's up with mortgages? They just have like, they have enough bread just to pay the whole house off. <laughs> it's it's an interesting thing. Do you do you race to pay the thing off all at once, or do you work at investing it in in various things? That that that's always a loaded question, and there, we don't have time <laughs> to get into that today. Um, so, I hopefully hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of. Uh, proportionate giving that yes the 10% I can tell you from my own personal experience is very possible and attainable for the general public and you trust God and it will be there now having said all of that getting into part six we need to acknowledge that this can be a sore spot for people as is touched upon in the introduction to this lesson, the subject of Christian giving is a sore spot for many Christians. When the subject of money arises in the church, people will often groan or cringe or complain. 
What I'd like for you to do here, number one, is take a few moments and write down some reasons why you think people don't like it when the topic of money is brought up in the church or when the pastor talks about giving money to the church in one of his sermons. Um, you might be a little bit too young to really have experienced this last statement, but maybe um, you can write down the reasons that you may have that you don't like it when um, the topic of money comes up in the church. And uh, while you're writing that down, I'll have some music that I'll go along with it. I think kind of theme-appropriate music. Problem is, I can't play it out on the internet because it's copyrighted. So those who aren't who are watching online, they're not going to be able to get it. Um, they'll just be a blank black screen for a little while with words there telling you to pause if you want, whatever. Um, but I'll start the music in a little bit. You guys can get going at writing down some thoughts to this. So the song said, money, get away. Out of curiosity, does anybody actually know that song? It's kind of old, but... No? You get, you've heard it a couple times? I've heard it once. Heard it once? You know, both? You, have you ever heard it? No. No? Because I know your, I bet Dollars to Donuts, your mom knows exactly what that song was. Most likely. You guys ever hear the music group called Pink Floyd? Yep, that is Pink Floyd from their album Dark Side of the Moon, which came out back in the 1970s. One of the uh, top-selling albums of all time, and it's the song uh, called Money. And, uh, yeah, very fitting. It says, Money, get away. And so, we've got this first one here. One thought that I've had, nobody's business what I give to the church, but maybe I... I Push the button on that a little bit too soon. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ones that you guys came up with? Anna? Thinking it's spent on something is like unnecessary. Oh, so oh, so the church might spend it on something yeah. unnecessary. So the church not making good use of, yeah? Uh, the, they might think they're just greedy. Oh, it just might boil down to greed. Yeah, definitely. Good answers. What are some others here? Quinn. Um, all right, push, force, compel, and has that happened at times? Has the church done that? Absolutely. Yep. Not enough. What do you mean, not enough? Like, someone might not have enough to give. I guess. Okay, so they don't feel like they have enough to give. Jalen? People feel obligated to pay the church. All right. It feels like it's more of an obligation. Very good. Anything else, Dylan? What did you write down? Uh, church can be greedy. Yep, same thing as what Caleb said. Okay, well, actually, now it's the opposite, right? Because I think Caleb was emphasizing the greed of the individual. Or oh, both? Or are you doing both? I'm doing okay. All of both. Okay, so the greed of the individual, like, no, I don't want to give because I love money. Uh, not that they would actually come out and say that, but that's really what's going on in their hearts. You're looking at it from the other side of the coin of the church could be greedy. Has the church uh, given that or projected that image before of greed? Absolutely. You definitely could say that. Others. Brody, did you write anything down? Yeah, greed. Same thing? All right. Some good thoughts, guys. How about you, Jada? Maybe they don't have a whole lot to give. All right. So... Like I said, I already got this one. It's not a, nobody's business what I give to the church. Now, on the surface, is that true? <coughs> That's nobody's business, Ladesha, what you give to the church. It's not. Okay, explain your answer. It's not really like... Like, I guess, like, if someone asks, you could tell them if you want. Well... I don't know how to explain that. Like, All right, maybe Anna can give you a help. You don't really want to boast about giving, about like mm -hmm. having a bunch of money and enough to give out. Yep, you don't want the self attention. One thing that I really uh, find frustrating is like when you go to some churches and they've got these beautiful stained glasses. Sometimes they'll have a plaque right beneath them that says "Donated by so and so," and just like, whose glory is this for? Is this for God's glory? 
or for the glory of the person who is publicizing uh, that they're, they're the ones who donated for it. Yeah. Well, you, you get like a high amount of money and someone else does it, they could be like, they're not giving enough. All right, yeah. Like, okay, you know, um, Dylan, he gave a whole bunch. Look how awesome Dylan is. But Brody, he, he didn't give it all this last year. And what's happened is some churches have actually... Uh, at the end of every year, what they would do, and maybe some still do, I don't, I don't think so, but it has happened in the past. I know of churches who have done this. They will post a list of everybody in the church and exactly what they gave. Yeah, I see a couple of eyes going, uh -huh. Yeah, that, that stuff has happened. Not good stewardship practice on the part of the church. A shaming list. No. On the, taken by itself, Yes. It is nobody's business what you give. I have never looked at the offering records um, at a church. In fact, if when the offering plate comes up to the front and I happen to see an envelope facing face up and the dollar amount is written on there, I'll either A, look away, or B, in my previous congregation, uh, what would happen sometimes would be I would... I would take the, the, the collection plates and uh, take them to the front from the usher. Uh, I might even flip those over so I didn't see it. Because it's not my business. You know, if somebody has a spiritual problem, the first problem I'm going to be addressing is not what they're giving. <laughs> That's not it. Having said that, though, is there anybody who can say, yeah, it's their business to tell us what to give? God's, right? But that, that's where it starts and ends. So how would they track what people give out? Like, do they... Ah, good question. How, do you, how does a church keep track? The church, the church keeps track. Like, so when you get confirmed, you receive those offering envelopes. And those offering envelopes have... Uh, your name is linked to the number on the offering envelope. And they keep track of it, uh, not so much to keep tabs on, ooh, what you that's what you're giving or uh, ooh, uh, making sure Caleb has come to church. Sadly, I know of a specific Wells Church who did that. They track church attendance by offerings. Not a good practice. Uh, my my former uh, church council president in my previous congregation, he, he left his previous church because that's what they were doing. And that's wrong because some people might choose not to use those offering envelopes and just put cash in the plate instead. That's what he was doing to test something and Unfortunately, he was right. But the reason for having those offering envelopes is for tax purposes. Because at the end of the year, <clears throat> uh, when, when all the offerings for that, that calendar year have been collected, an, uh, an offering report will go out to each of the families who are members of the church. And one, that can be helpful just in a practical sense of Letting people know, okay, here's what you've actually been giving. So it could be a good um, a way for an individual to evaluate what they're giving. But it also is just for the purposes of tax breaks. Because your charitable contributions to the church can be used to be written off on your taxes. And you get a tax deduction from it. So there's that practical aspect to it as well. Yes, Would that count as like a gift Charitable contributions, yes, yes they are. And the government recognizes those and uh, will, will incentivize them actually by giving those deductions. The next one, the church is only concerned about my money and closely related to that, the pastor talks about money too much or maybe the pastor shouldn't talk about money from the pulpit. Now, if the pastor is talking about money from the pulpit all the time, can you see how people would get this impression. Absolutely. That could be potentially a legitimate complaint. It's not always. Sometimes people will just say that when it's not true uh, to mask some other thing going on inside of them. I actually had a, a member at my previous church who literally said that, and I'm just like, no, I'm sorry, you just have no biblical footing for that. Um, do, should pastors on occasion talk about um, the management of money from the pulpit? Yes, absolutely, because the Bible talks about it a lot. As we heard last week, over 2,000 passages 
In fact, if anything, if that's how many passages the Bible talks about it, we could possibly talk about it even more. But we don't. Next one. The church doesn't spend its money wisely. Who, who was the one who said something to that effect? I think that was you. Yeah. Now, having said that, is that a, a justifiable excuse not to give? No. Next one. It could be a lack of understanding for and appreciation in what the offerings support. Like, why? What's my purpose in doing this? What's so important about it? Well, that's why we looked at that last week with the goal of giving. A lack of faith and trust in God that he will provide for our needs. I just don't think I'm going to have enough. And yet you've got the example of the widow in Jerusalem that Jesus points out who gives her two mites, basically two coins that was worth the equivalent of like a penny. That was all that she had left. And rather than cling to that as her last desperate hope to provide for herself, she gives it away to God. Yeah, you might not be able to give much, but you still probably can give something uh, unless you are in a desperate situation. But for most of us, that is not true. Apathy toward the ministry of the church. Like, yeah, I don't care. That's not important. Well, now you've got a, a heart problem because... A heart that is moved by Christ's love is going to recognize the importance of this. And the church uses poor motivators like guilt and fear and shame to get people to give. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The church has too much money. Could that, it, you, that That's happened before. You don't want to be so sitting on so much money that you're not spending it and using it. You don't want to be extracting money against people's will while you have the money to fund things. And then greed. What a lot of you are getting at here. Okay, part seven then. Our motivation in Christian giving. So remember what we read earlier. Because I do not seek your possessions, but you. Ministry is not about large bank accounts. It's about people. God cares about us far more than about what we have. And that thought is integral to our motivation in Christian giving. Now, what are some basic ways that humans motivate other humans to do things? Caleb. Money. Ah, rewards and incentives. Yes. So when I was uh, a little kid, I liked to talk a lot. Don't laugh. Some things haven't changed, right, Glenn? To be able to put it more bluntly, I didn't, I didn't know how to shut up. You can think of kids, that, <laughs> think of a few who are maybe like that a little bit. Um, that was definitely me. And when we would go out to eat as a, with my extended family on my mom's side, what would happen sometimes is my mom's oldest brother would get so tired of me just constantly going like this that he would actually say, you know, if you're quiet for two minutes or five minutes, whatever it was, something like that, I'll give you a quarter. And you think, quarter, that's nothing easy. But remember back then, that was, that was good for a video game. So, for a little that, worked, that worked for me. And not only did it work, you know, once the five minutes were up, I got the quarter or two minutes, whatever, but I was gone. So it was like double bonus for, for my uncle. It was a win-win. Um, it worked! He got his piece of quiet. I got my video game. Rewards and incentives. What's another motivator? Not like a good one, but if you're being like threatened. Yeah, threats. Like I say, Caleb, give me a hundred bucks. Yeah, right. <laughs> threats and punishments. What are some other ones? You guys are doing good. No. Jalen. Compliments. What's that? Compliments. Okay. I don't have that listed. That could be a, 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 a good one in the sense of maybe positive reinforcement. Um, a philanthropic spirit. I'll mention that a little bit later. Yes? I don't think it's an exercise. 
size, I don't know. No. <laughs> you want to like outdo other things? Competition, okay. I don't have that up here, but that, you know. Here's one. Brody, we need you to give more to church. You don't want to make baby Jesus cry, do you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Guilt, yes. Exactly, Guilt. <laughs> Don't make baby Jesus cry. Don't make baby Jesus make baby cry. Baby. Yes. Other motivators, ways to motivate people. Jalen. Next Sunday, you better be giving 500 bucks. I'm going to share all of those uh, sensitive pictures Black that you took of yourself. <laughs> Blackmail, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Right, right. No. Whoa. Yeah. Like embarrassing someone, maybe? Well, that's what blackmail is. Yeah. Oh, like, that, that, that blackmail or manipulation, I'll yeah. I'll tell your mom. With the sheets of paper, they're like, this person don't have this this one. Right, oh, the shaming, yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can put that by shame, and I've got, there's others as well. Uh, now, some of these may be practical and effective in the world, and they may even produce results in the church, but, you know, this one, rewards and incentives, not necessarily bad. Threats and punishment, not necessarily bad either, uh, like especially with behavior. Um, guilt, okay, depending on the situation, all right. Blackmail, obviously, never good. Manipulation, never good. While these may be, uh, to varying degrees, useful and effective in the world, some of them uh, legitimate, some of them is shady, so well, I'm definitely not legitimate. All of these are improper ways to motivate Christian giving. Every single one of them. And some of them, like I said, just flat out wrong. And unfortunately, uh, churches have resorted to each of these in the past. And maybe that leads some people to think, well, that's the way that God operates. Yeah. Say that, you know, if you give $10, we'll give you 11 Ah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I give to get. That, that, and that, you know, like let's say with um, silent auctions, there could be issues with that. Uh, you give to get something, um, and that's a whole other topic that I, I, I don't have the time to get into, but there, there's a lot of good discussion that could come out of that. But, do you view your giving as your obligation to meet or your debt to pay or a burden that God is trying to extract from you against your will? Some people do. Because if that's how you view these things, then you are missing something fundamental about the heart of God. Our first Bible passage for tonight, Jalen... 1 John 4, verse 19. We love because he loved us first. All right. We love because he first loved us. So our love is driven, is motivated by his love for you and me. The next passage kind of says the same thing. Jada, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ, we love the love of Christ compels us because we came to this conclusion. One died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died in their place and was raised again. All right, so according to the italicized portion there, what motivates our Christian giving? What motivates it? According to that passage, Jada. Him dying all right, really, it's Christ's love, or God's love for us in Jesus Christ. I mean, this is what God wants us to know. It, it, it's totally different than anything else in this world, and yet for us, it's everything. It's our motivation. It's our reason for living. It's our reason for giving. It's what God wants us to know, and it's our reason for doing his will. It is Christ's love. That is what compels us, what motivates us <laughs> In our Christian giving. We don't give 
to get. We don't give to feel good, although that may be a side benefit there. We don't give to compete. We don't give to avoid threats or punishments or guilt. We give because God has already given. And that leads to the next passage, Leah. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. So when it says here that Jesus was rich, what period of time was this talking about? Dylan? Him in heaven? Yeah, before he came to earth, when he was still in heaven. And if that's when he was rich, the next question then being, when did he become poor? Question number four. Uh, we'll wait till everybody finishes writing. Quinn. When he came down to earth. When he came to earth. When he temporarily set aside the full use of his divine power so that he could live for us and die for us. Yeah. <clears throat> now think about this. Even if Jesus had been raised in a palace and had all the luxuries of this world at his disposal, he still would have been, com been poor when compared to the richness of heaven. And yet he wasn't even born into that. He was born to a uh, some people who couldn't even afford adequate housing when he was born, who didn't have a nice crib to be put into, had to be laid down in an animal's feeding trough. Not exactly the majestic setting for the Son of God coming into this world. And then that's to say nothing about how he literally became the poorest of the poor when he died on the cross with all of the sins of this whole world on his shoulders. And then looking at that passage, question number five. Why did Jesus do this? Quinn, or, sorry, Jalen. Because he loves us. And, but correct, that, that's what motivated him to do it. But why, or what is the, the result or the purpose of this, Dylan? So we can be rich? Yeah, so that we might become rich. You know, rich with God's forgiveness, rich being adopted into his family, rich with the promise of eternal inheritance in heaven. You don't necessarily need to write the whole thing down, but just emphasizing how we are rich. We are rich in ways that we cannot even begin to fathom. Our riches are hidden with God in heaven, but they are there. Was that a question that you had, Ladesha? Okay. No, we're, we're going to start winding things down. Well, no, I shouldn't say that, but I, you'll be able to last. Okay? All right. Now, there are a lot of instances that talk about uh, examples of giving in the Bible. Some good, some not so good. And we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But we're going to focus on a couple of good examples of generous giving. Uh, the first example, it says there in the bold type, reflects on the generosity of King David. It comes in the last months of his life as he's setting his house in order. David had recently procured the future site of the temple. Then he organized a labor force and some initial building materials. Then he dipped into the national treasury and diverted a significant amount of resources for the construction of the temple. And I cannot um, emphasize how... Um, how much he diverted. Now, this is an understatement when I say significant. Uh, Vedesha, could you, looking at Aaliyah's packet, read First Chronicles 22, verse 14? Look, with great effort I have provided 100 talents of gold for the house of the Lord, a million talents of silver, and too much bronze and iron to be weighed. I have provided provided lumber and stones you may add to what I have provided. Okay, so there's a lot of different materials here being used in the construction of the temple to um, you know decorate the dazzle, bling out the temple, however you want to put it. Uh, we're just going to focus on the gold. So I got the statistics there in your packet. I'm going to put them on the screen as well. But 100,000 talents of gold, that equals 
3,450 3, metric tons. Now that many tons is 110,912,077 troy ounces. Gold is measured by a slightly different standard than your typical ounce. Your typical ounce is about 91% of the weight of a troy ounce. So um, it's, you know, 2,000 pounds in a ton. So it's going to be weighing a bit more than 2,000. Um, I don't know what the exact number, 2,200 or so, 2,100 something and change uh, per, uh, well, about 20, almost 2,200 pounds. Uh, in, a, in a single metric ton, but we're talking 3,450 metric tons. How many of you have ever heard of Fort Knox? Yeah? What do you know about Fort Knox? Oh, the One of the largest gold treasuries in the U.S., correct. Well, if you took just over 75% of the gold in Fort Knox, that's the amount of gold we're talking about here. Let that thought sink in. America, the richest, most powerful nation in the history of the world, and its own largest individual repository of gold. There's others as well. But also the most secure one. This is the most secure site in the world. In fact, it's so secure that when World War II happened, Great Britain uh, sent over on a boat the actual Magna Carta document from the 13th century, I believe it was, to America to keep it safe, and it was stored at Fort Knox. In fact, I think the last time the doors were open to the vaults was back during the Nixon administration in the 1970s. You just don't see it, you don't get into it. If President Biden right now wanted to go and see the gold, he wouldn't be allowed to. That's how secure it is. 75% or just over that of the gold in Fort Knox used just in the construction and the decoration of this temple. That is incredible. Now, is it the largest repository of gold in the United States? No. Does anybody know where the largest repository is? Probably in California. Nope, nope. This is interesting. See, part of the reason why this is most secure is that it's right on a military base. Good luck. Uh -huh. Nope, not Arizona. That's most of the New York. US. Up in Maine. New York City. Right in the middle by the New York Stock Exchange. It's the, the New York Federal Reserve Building has uh, not significantly larger, but noticeably larger than this. And the reason why that's secure is because, uh, well, try getting it out of downtown New York City. <laughs> you got a little bit of a problem with traffic. Uh, it ain't going to work so well. Uh, but most of that gold is the gold of foreign nations uh, that is being stored here, and we, we can guarantee its safety. Yes? Where is Fort Knox? Kentucky. Yep, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Yep. So mind you, just to give you a visualization of this, this uh, picture here, um, one metric ton of gold is the equivalent of 80 of these gold bullion. So like a gold brick is called a gold bullion. You take 80 of these, multiply this red box here by 3,450. Bro. That's a lot of gold. Uh-huh. And just think, this is literal, little, little Israel. A nation that was basically the size of the land from here down to Sioux Falls. Oh. All right? It ain't that big of a nation. And they had this amount. And back then, there was a lot less gold that had been mined and ored from the earth and uh, thus a lot less gold to go around to the various nations. So this constituted a much larger percentage of the, the total gold in the world at that time. Is it? 276,000 bars. Thank you. Wow. The book value on this is $4.683 billion. Now, mind you, book value is different than street value. Street value would be way much more because book value is based off of 
uh, $42.22 per ounce. And I haven't looked at gold in a long while, but usually gold is hovering uh, somewhere around 1800 to 2000 uh, these days. It, it could be way off of that right now. I don't know, but historically, that's where it has been the last several years when I last checked. So uh, the number would be much, much bigger, but that's a street value. That's an inflated value. If you all of a sudden flooded the market with all this gold, the, uh, the value of gold would just absolutely crash. Why is gold so expensive? I mean, it could have been anything. Like rocks could have been like considered gold. Right. Why, why is it that, that humans decided to attach value to gold? I thought that, yeah, it's pretty. It's I thought that question myself. What is it that gives something value? It's what it's humans shiny. decide is valuable. It's so a bunch shiny. Of, so yeah. a bunch of people that everyone trusts in just decided, oh, this is important. Let's mark this as $1,000. This is going to be our currency. Yep, exactly. They did that with the diamond. That one company owns De Beers. Like all of the diamonds. De Beers, yep. Yep. In Africa, African conflict diamonds and all that. Yep. We should just make up our own with rocks. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so, however, that was not all the gold that went. Looking at the next one, in addition to what was given from Israel's national reserves, David tapped into his own royal treasury, which was like his personal hedge fund against disaster or trouble. Uh, next passage, 1 Chronicles 29, 3-5, Remy. Because of my devotion to the house of my God, my personal treasure of gold and silver. I'm also giving for the house of my God in addition to all that I have already provided for this holy house. 3,000 pounds of gold Ophir. From Ophir, yeah. From Ophir. Don't know what that is. 7,000 pounds of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the structures. I have given gold for gold items and silver for silver items for all the work by the craftsmen. Okay, so to break that down, 3,000 talents, we're talking about 100 metric tons, obviously substantially smaller, but still nothing to sneeze at because it has a book value of 135.74 million. Uh, so a considerable amount. Uh, now, what we also don't hear is, you know, David is personally telling all of Israel, this is what I'm giving. Why do you think David broadcast what he was giving? make everyone else go. Exactly. Yep. Here's your leader leading from the front, kind of like what I was doing earlier and saying, this is what I am able to give. And it worked too. People saw David's leadership and then the leaders of Israel responded in kind and gathered together. They got uh, 5,000 talents of gold. And mind you, throughout all this dis discussion, we've been focused on the gold, but we haven't Talked about the silver, the bronze, the wood, and all of this. Okay? There's a lot more going into it than just the gold. Now, David gave this. And question number one, this personal hedge fund was like a lifeline and security blanket for him. This is what kings had if anything ended up going bad for them. And they had to make a run for it. David's giving it all away. What does this tell us about him? He's not very smart. He's not wise. You don't think so? Well, no, because anything can happen. All right. But what is David showing right now? I am glad you said that. Generosity. First, he's showing his generosity. Yeah. And that's the thing. This is an expression of faith, that he is not going to put his faith in money or military might or those things, that his trust is going to be put in God. And uh, through you, when you look at Israel's history, the kings that did that and did not put their trust in military might, they're the ones that God blessed. You go ahead... Uh, about a few hundred years from David's time to one of his descendants, King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah had no, had very little money left. He had uh, no army really legitimately to defend himself with. He's uh, 
holed up inside of Jerusalem along with uh, a good number of Jews. And the armies of Assyria under the command of their king Sennacherib outside knocking at the door. 188,000 of them, to be precise. By the way, have any of you ever seen uh, the Lord of the Rings movies? Some of you? Have you seen the third one yet? No? Okay, uh, Return of the King. When you do, and you see all of the armies outside of uh, Gondor, of Minas Tirith, the capital of Gondor, that computer-generated army is comprised of 200,000 soldiers. So very, very, very comparable to what Sennacherib had encircling Jerusalem. And so when you look at that army, and you're just like, holy buckets, um, this looks hopeless. That's what Hezekiah was facing. And yet he, he took his concern to God, he put his faith in God to handle that situation. And in one night, God put to death that entire army. And even, uh, even though uh, we, you know, we have some of the actual writings of Sennacherib, which is interesting, and even though Sennacherib doesn't actually come out and say that's what happened because, you know, it looks embarrassing and you're not going to publicly say, yeah, I just got my, my butt handed to me uh, by Israel's God after I, I dissed him a little bit too much and uh, ran with my tail between my legs back to Assyria. Um, you're not going to come out saying those things, but... The absence of what he says in regard to Jerusalem. After saying, yeah, I, I, I went up and marched against this city, kicked its butt and took it over. I did, went up against this city, kicked its butt, took it over. He gets to Jerusalem and, yeah, I, I marched up against this city. <laughs> David was putting his trust in God. And what, question number two, practical application is there for us? We can also trust that God is going to take care of us. God has given us every reason to trust that he is going to take care of us. And so he, based on his promises, has given us the ability to be generous givers. Yes, Dylan? Did that temple get robbed? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, and, and I wondered about this too, Dylan, because... It, that temple was ultimately destroyed in the year 586 B.C. by the Babylonian army. But when they destroyed it, how much of all that stuff actually still remained? Because I believe it was Shishak, uh, one of the pharaohs of Egypt, <clears throat> had previously come in and conquered the city at some point, like a couple hundred years prior to that. How much did he strip the temple? Good question. We don't really know the full answer to that. Uh, but ultimately, it was pillaged and plundered and destroyed entirely in 586 B.C. Yes? Does that mean you might still be able to like, go there and kind of, like, do the gold over there? No, because you know what? Well, after the, you know, you had the first temple destroyed in 586 B.C., and then Jerusalem lay in ruins for the next 70 plus years. Eventually, the second temple was built, all right? But that was destroyed in the year 70 A.D. by, I believe it was uh, Titus, uh, the Roman general at the time. Um, what currently stands on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? Oh no, there's something. Like a Muslim, I think. Yeah, it's a Muslim, uh, it's a big Muslim uh, mosque or whatever. Does anybody know what it's called? It's called the Dome of the Rock. So when you look at a picture of Jerusalem, you see this big uh, building with a big honking dome. Uh, that's, that's on the site of the old temple, uh, both where both temples were. But if Solomon's temple, that first temple, had remained to the time of Jesus, it easily would have been considered one of the ancient wonders of the world, just for how magnificent it was. In fact, uh, interesting you asked that question, because I'll be mentioning it in passing in uh, this Sunday's sermon. Yeah. Wasn't Titus the guy who killed Jesus? <clears throat> no, Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Okay, let's get into the second generous example of giving in the Bible. This one comes from the Macedonian Christians. <clears throat> Macedonia is like a 
kind of like a Greek-speaking country just to the north of Greece. Uh, Paul talking about them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as he's talking about this collection that is uh, that he's going around gathering for the church in Jerusalem. Uh, Dylan, could you read those verses, please? Now, brother, we want you to know about the grace of God that was given in the churches of Macedonia. Macedonia. In the, ser in the seven tests, severe. severe tests of trouble, their overflowing joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the abundance, abundance. Of, abundance of their generosity. generosity. I testify that their own free will. They'll give according to their ability and, they, and even beyond their ability. Pleading with us, with our urgent request for the gracious privilege of joining in the service of in the service to the saints. Okay. So the question here in regard to the Macedonian Christians, number three, according to the italicized portion of this passage, what motivated the Macedonian Christians to give for this special collection? Looking at that one italicized word. Grace. Yeah, it was God's grace. Like I was mentioning earlier, it wasn't some sort of self-created philanthropic spirit that motivated them to give. Meaning that, oh, I got these warm fuzzies uh, for giving and made me feel good on the inside knowing that I helped somebody out. Was that a tangible blessing and benefit? Sure. But that wasn't their goal and their purpose. Uh, the, 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 the goal and purpose was they were motivated by the love of God that they had received. And this is incredible because we have to keep in mind who the Macedonian Christians were. And one church in particular, we think of the church in the Macedonian city called Thessalonica which literally means victory by the sea. Uh, Thessalonike. Nike, Nike, mean, uh, so Nike shoe means victory. Thessala is the word sea. Anyway, um, the Thessalonians, it was an interesting situation. As we hear here, they're extremely poor. And what we also learn from elsewhere in the New Testament especially in the book of Acts, and also in Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians, when they became Christians, things changed for them, for the better and for the worse. For the better, because they had the joy of the gospel. And they, they loved <clears throat> of hearing about God's love and forgiveness for them in Christ Jesus. However, it came, <coughs> excuse me, it came with some pretty incredible persecution. It was especially fierce in Thessalonica. It made it life very, very rough for them. And yet, they're still being motivated here by God's love and grace uh, to share that overflowing love even toward complete strangers. Question number four. According to the underlined portions of this passage, what was their financial situation like? I already kind of mentioned that. They're poor. Yeah, extremely poor. Extreme poverty. And what could this have led them to do when Paul told them about this special offering? He sends a message to them. We got this special offering coming up. <clears throat> and you hear this. Put yourself in their shoes. You hear about this offering. You know your financial situation. You don't have much at all. What, are you, what could this have led the Thessalonians to do? Are you going to be as willing to participate in this offering, Quinn? No. Why not? Because it means that I get the right of heaven. All right. Yep. Reasonable concern, right? And so if Paul is saying, hey, we're going to be having this offering, what might you be saying back to Paul? Okay. Yeah. To ask to be excused from the offering. That's all that you need to write, by the way. <clears throat> the rest of it just there for emphasis. Paul wasn't going to hold it against them. Nobody was. There was they were in no position to be able to give. <clears throat> you can't extract blood from a turnip. You can't expect them to give something that they just, quite frankly, don't have. And yet, question number five, according to the bold portion of this passage, 
how much did the Macedonians give? So, first of all, we hear, yes, they do give, but then how much do they give? According to that bold part. Beyond their own ability. Yeah, even beyond their ability. Now, it's important for us to note here, Paul is emphasizing the attitude behind the gift. He's not emphasizing the gift itself. And this also isn't meant to be, this example is not meant to be uh, used as a club to beat somebody over the head. That, let's say, you know, Jalen is extremely poor, and I shouldn't be coming up to her with 2 Corinthians 8 here and smacking her on the head with it, saying, see, the Macedonians did it, you can too. No, that's, that's not what, what Paul is getting at here. Uh, these people did it without any sort of compulsion. Paul wasn't forcing them. They did it purely as a response of their joy to the gospel. They did it with a clear conscience. But one other thing, too, and take a quick look at the passage. Verse 3, it says, I testify that of their own free will they gave according to their ability, and even beyond their ability. And then verse 4, pleading with us with an urgent request. So it's like, it's like Paul was telling them, hey, guys, you know what? It, it's okay. You don't need to be giving this. And they're like, no, 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 Paul, please, don't, don't hinder us from giving. We want to give. Please don't let us. Uh, please don't, don't refuse this offering. Please accept it. I mean, just think about that. It's this overflowing joy in the midst of extreme poverty, this uh, <clears throat> rich generosity going on in the midst of this fierce persecution. It doesn't make sense. And yet it does from our perspective because of how they were motivated by that grace of God. They wanted to give. And they wanted to give because God first decided to give His very best. And that is the attitude for us all to emulate. So in closing, God's promises to remember. As we prepare ourselves to give, it is helpful to keep in mind God's promises in relation to Christian giving. Brody, Matthew 6.33. But seek the first kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, food, drink, clothing, will be given you as well. All right. Putting God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And then Malachi 3, 10 to 12, Caleb. Bring the complete tithe to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Just test me in this. Just test me in this, says the Lord of armies. armies. See whether I do not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out down pour down blessing on you until there is more than enough i will restrain from devouring swarm so that it will not destroy your produce from your soil your vine in the field will not be without fruit says the lord of that the nation will call you blessed, blessed, because you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of Aries. All right. So the question here, according to the italicized sections of these passages, what promises from God should we keep in mind as we consider our offerings? Basically, what we have going on here. Have you ever seen the movie A Christmas Story? Yeah. You know, Ralphie with the Red Rider BB? It's like a triple dog dare going on here right now. God says, you don't believe that I'm going to take care of you if you give generously? In Malachi, he's talking about giving of the tithe, the 10%. You don't believe that I can look after you and bless you? And there's other ways to bless us besides financially. And he talks about them a little bit in Malachi. He says, test me. I triple dog dare you to do this and see if I won't, you know, just ridiculously bless you in your life. What promises from God? Well, that he's going to provide. 
that when we put his kingdom first in our lives, and there's so many different ways that you can apply that passage from Matthew's gospel of putting God's kingdom first. You can put it in uh, first in regard to how we live and the, uh, the, the choices in life that we make. Also in regard to our offerings. That when we prioritize uh, God's kingdom with the money that he has blessed to us, he is going to take care of us. All those things, the necessities of life, food, clothing, drink, he is going to give to us as well. We have that promise of God. And that ought to motivate us to be those regular, proportionate, generous, eager, willing, first fruit, faithful givers. Any questions as we finish this lesson and we think about that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that we might become rich. And we are rich. All right, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, guys.